Today, we'll be talking about power with others as opposed to power over others. Having power with others is very higher brain, will help us optimize our performance. Having power over others is very lower brain and will block us from optimizing our performances. Optimize your tribe. Why be in a high functioning tribe? And a lot of this social programming has been going on uh, for a long time. For example, back in hunter-gatherer times, in order to survive, we had to live in, the tr in a tribe. And remember, the main goal of our lower brain is survival. The main goal of our higher brain is to thrive. Um, and in order to survive, believe it or not, it was social status that decided uh, our best chance of survival. Because the higher that we were in the tribe, uh, the more uh, water, food, and shelter we received when things were short. So once again, by being uh, higher on the pecking order, by having power over others, it helped us to survive. Well, once again, we don't need to survive anymore. We don't need this old programming. We need to thrive. Years of lower brain programming have caused us to want to be superior to other tribe members. That's power over others. All these competitive dynamics we have in our brain and our lower brain are really lower brain dynamics. Much more magical is having power with others. We are co-creating, co-discovering, co-experimenting, co-building things. There's no rush like it. That feeling of community that comes from any kind of shared victory, the feeling of connection. What if you live that all the time, moment to moment, day to day, that's the emotional power of having power with others and co-creating things. We can, we can live by having power with others and not be beholden to the lower brain self-esteem trick of having power over others. Um, just like in hunter-gatherer times, we needed to live in a tribe to survive. Nowadays, we need, we need to live in a high-functioning tribe. It helps us to thrive. Uh, we cannot thrive on our own. The world is moving too complex and too fast for us to thrive on our own. Go ahead and watch this video by Simon Simic, where he explains in an excellent way uh, the power of having power with others as opposed to having power over others. The way we find fulfillment is by doing good for others. So how do the Marines do it? How do you get people to do good for others? We all know this. Intellectually, we know that it's good to do good for others, but why don't we do it then? Why don't we do it? And what the Marines learned is something that I completely did not expect. They can't just yell at these guys to help each other. That's not what happens. There's a few things that they have to do first. So we all have heard of the obstacle course, right? The Marines have a thing called the obstacle course. And this is where they, they build anaerobic strength and aerobic strength, muscle strength, and it's timed and all of this good stuff. They have another course called the confidence course, and it's never timed. And most of the obstacles on this course cannot be completed by yourself. They must be completed in teams. You have no choice. That's just how it's designed. And what they say is the first two weeks of boot camp, everybody's there to outdo each other and prove that they're strong. Just kind of like when we start in a job, we prove we want to show how great we are, we'll work a little harder, we'll do good work, look how good my design is, right? It's all about us and how good we are, right? But they keep putting them in situations where they can't do things by themselves. And what starts to happen very slowly, they said after about two weeks, they start cheering for each other. Now they get in trouble when they do, but they start cheering for each other. And then before too long, you see them organically start helping each other. <clears throat> and what happens is if there's one person who's weak and refuses to help each other, the others, or even if there's one person who's strong, who's, you know, I was the star college athlete, and they get to every, the end of every obstacle, and they just stand there and wait for everybody to finish, and they don't help each other, what starts to happen is organically the group starts to ostracize that person. Organically, they get ostracized until they learn that the only way that they will get through this thing, the only way they will survive boot camp, is if they ask for help because they have no option. The problem is no one will help them until they're willing to help another. It's the deal we have to make. It's called vulnerability and risk. We have to take the risk to make ourselves vulnerable. Yes, you might do something for someone else and they may not do something back for you. That's the risk you run. That's the risk you run. It's not about, it's not about <clears throat> giving everything to them and, and sort of huge, big, overwhelming risk. It's about little things and little things. It's like going on a date, right? It's like if I went on a date with somebody, and I came home and I said, uh, after one date, I said, I'm marrying her. And people are like, what are you, nuts? 
I'll be like, I'm in love. They're like, but you're, you're, this, is, this is crazy. I'm like, I know, I'm in love, you know? <laughs> she feels the same way, we both know it's nuts, right? Now you know that you're gonna be like, eh, go on a couple more dates, right? <laughs> we know instinctively that the strong bond that's create, that, that needs to be created first takes more than a week, right? We know that, right? But if I've been dating somebody for seven years and we haven't you know, married, you'd be like, dude, what is wrong? Right? In other words, we know that it takes more than seven days, and we know that it takes less than seven years. <laughs> the problem is, we don't know how long it takes. It's somewhere in the middle. All human bonds are the same. Like when you show up at work, when you show up for the first time, when you're new, don't expect that people will look out for you, and they won't expect you to look out for them in seven days. It won't happen. But if you've been working at a job for a few years, and you don't have the un Done, the, the, sort of the, the absolute confidence that if you turn your back you will not get stabbed, you can rely on somebody, you can give them something, nothing will go wrong, you will share the credit, no one will throw you under the bus. If you don't have that in a few years, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I don't know how long it takes, but I know that's more than a week and I know it's less than seven years. And the Marines fundamentally understand that before anyone is willing to put themselves out for another, they have to have self-confidence. Real self-confidence. You have to be confident in yourself and your own ability before you're willing to help another. If you're insecure at all about your own ability, it's, an oxy it's sort of a paradox, right? How, am I, how can I overcome my confidence, you know, my self-confidence? And we all have ego issues at all times, you know, we all do, right? But if I'm not confident in myself, I won't help another. It's a paradox because then we need someone to look out for us before we're willing to help our peers, right? This is what management is supposed to do. The drill instructors, the school, they are there, our parents, they are there for one reason and one reason only, to help us feel strong and good about ourselves. But look at the way we talk to each other. Look, at the, look a budget's been cut, and so what do you get told? I need you guys to do more with less, right? That's what we're told. Hey guys, I need you guys to do more with less. That's what we're told by our clients, by our bosses, by our parents, this is what we're told, right? That's like your parents telling you when you're young, I know you're stupid, figure it out, <laughs> right? You're not as smart as the other kids. What do you want me to do? <laughs> right? It's the exact same thing. I need you to do more with less. Right? What we need to be telling people is, I need, to do, I need you to do more with what you have. Right? You have capacity. You have strength. You have talent. You have ability. I need you to do more with what you have. We don't celebrate what we've got. We criticize for what we don't have. This is the responsibility of management, to take us under their wing and help us understand our own value to ourselves. Close your eyes and think back to high school. And think of that one teacher who took you under their wing and cared for you and looked after you and helped you realize that you are capable of more than you thought you were. And you, and you, you probably are the person you are today in some part because of that person, right? Do you have that name? What's the name? Tell me the name. Tell me the name of the teacher. Okay, give me the name. Okay, I can point to anybody and you can tell me that name. Now tell me the names of all the other teachers you had that day. Can't remember them, can you? This is the power of those who teach us confidence. We will literally carry their names around with us for the rest of our lives. Wouldn't you want to be that person? Wouldn't you want to be the person that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, I can do this exercise with somebody and they will tell me your name. This is the power of helping others realize their own strengths. This is what management and leadership is supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be caring for us and helping us realize our own value. And by the way, if you have anybody who reports to you or works for you, your responsibility is not to make them meet the deadline your responsibility is not to make sure that they do as you say. Your responsibility is to make sure that they understand their own strengths, their own value, and that they are way, way more talented than they think they are. And the only way they will learn that is if you put them in situations in which they can fail. And you hold them and you support them and you give them talent and you give them skills and you give them education and you watch their backs and if they fall over you encourage them to get back up and if they fall over you encourage them to get back up and if they fall over you encourage them to get back up until they figure it out themselves. It's called confidence. It's your responsibility to help others find it and it's others' responsibility to help you, f you find yours. And the amazing thing is as soon as you start feeling confident in your own ability, you naturally help 
each other. That's what happens. It's called trust. In the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we are willing to give bonuses to people who will sacrifice others so that we may gain. We have it backwards. And then we complain about how we don't love our jobs, and we complain about how the work is suffering, and we complain about how budgets are being cut, and we compl complain, 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 and the first thing we do is blame each other and become more selfish and worry about my pay and my benefits and my this, and this is what happens. When we are unfulfilled, we look at the metrics and we say they're not good enough. When we are fulfilled, we don't care about the metrics. This is why when you have a job you love and you get a call that says, I'll offer you tons more money and great benefits, you're like, I'm not interested, I'm not interested, ah, I'm not interested, I'm very happy here. But we'll give you more. That's not the reason I'm here. I'm here because I love it. I'm here because I care for the people I work with, and I'm here because the people I work with care for me. This is the world I imagine. This is the world I imagine. And here's the great thing. If you take little risks, I'm not talking about big things, little things. If you start doing little things for each other, the amazing anthropological response is other people will start doing little things for others too. I was walking down the street two days ago and a guy's backpack was open and a whole bunch of paper fell out as he was walking down the street. And I happened to be behind him and so my friend and I just sort of, we were in mid-conversation and in mid-conversation, we never even stopped talking, we just bent down, sort of helped him gather his papers, hand them back to him, sort of pointed out that his book bag was, his, you know, his backpack was unzipped and he said thanks and we walked on. It was like no big deal, right? We get to the end of the, the street and we stand at the, the, we're waiting to cross the street. We're still talking, we haven't stopped talking. And the guy in front of us turns to us and says, I saw you help that guy. That was really cool. <laughs> but here's what's great about that. The guy will go do something for someone else simply because he saw us bend down and pick up paper for someone else. He will actually go do something for someone else because of it. Right? He, he won't give to charity because I, he sees me put a dollar in a cup. But he will actually help someone because he saw someone also help someone. Little things. Hold a door open for someone. Say thank you to the person who holds the door open for you. Smile to the barista. Little, little things. You're, you know, put your foot in the subway when the door is closing so someone who's running will make it. Hit the open at the, at the elevator. Don't go... <laughs> or pretend you didn't see. That's the best one. You know? Oh, I, didn't, I would have if I saw. Sorry. Right? Do it a little time and a little energy. And you'll find around work that people give a little time and a little energy back to you. And you'll give a little more time and a little more energy. You go for a coffee with someone. Then you go for a two hour coffee. Then you go for a coffee and a lunch. Then you go for a lunch and a dinner. Then you go for a dinner and a movie. And then you sleep over. And then you sleep over two nights. And then you go on holiday together. And eventually you get married, right? <laughs> it's slow. It takes time and we can't rush it. You know, if when we rush it, it's all fake. Do things for others and watch, watch how much others do for you. Buy, you know, go, you go get yourself a cup of coffee from the coffee machine in the morning, make one for someone else. It takes a little extra time, it takes a little extra energy. That's the point. That's the point. And here's the best part. You will feel so good at the end of the day. So good. Thank you very much. The best way to have power with others is to be a transformational leader. Uh, and uh, nobody has to know you're doing this. It goes against everything we've been raised and programmed to think. You need to be very higher brain to be a transformational leader. But the payoff is a win-win. You are much more powerful and influential and the team will be much more successful. You'll be having way more eat fun compared to being lower brain and worrying about getting yours. Simply by role modeling, being higher brain dominant, You'll have, an, you'll have an enormous impact on yourself and the people around you. But once again, it's not easy because it's been, it goes against everything that we've been taught uh, to be. And here are two of the great transformational leaders, uh, Nicholas Littstrom and Steve Iserman. <clears throat> For years with the Detroit Red Wings, they led that team by role modeling, uh, being higher brain dominant and, and handling everybody in a higher brain way. Um, it's not a surprise that that organization, under the guidance and the leadership of these two uh, star players, 
won several Stanley Cups. Oftentimes inside a team we are competing. Uh, here's this really talented person and you think all I have is this one puzzle piece. I'm not as good. What is the goal? To compare with who has the most puzzle pieces, who's the best, or is the goal to put the puzzle together and create something successful? We are so fixated on comparing. Maximum happiness and success is to put all these talented pieces and players together to create something successful and beautiful. That reward is much more sustainable, produces many more happiness neurochemicals, and is much more successful for the team and for you as an individual. Put the focus on creating joy, on, put the focus on creative joy rather than, rather than being smart or dumb, successful or failure, good or bad, any of those lower brain tricks. And this is how we become a transformational leader. We use the seven tools that we teach to uh, either get out of our lower brain, uh, steer away from our lower brain, being triggered, and at the same time, activating our higher brain. Because if we can do everything uh, and, and try to be um, as higher brain as possible, we'll never be perfect. It's a practice, not a perfection, but we use the tools on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to be as higher brain as possible. Um, and trust me, life gives us no shortage of opportunities to work on using these tools and being higher brain dominant. Then we use language and actions to keep the people around us higher brain dominant. When we're doing that, it's a win-win and we are uh, having such a, a great time, so much eat fun, engaged, activated and thrilled with the moment-to-moment -moment joy of our task and we're having an unbelievable amount of power with others which will bring the maximum success for the team or the organization or the family or the tribe and at the same time it will bring the maximum success for us as individuals. It is a win-win.